Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here today to brief you on the latest developments related to the Syrian government's official request addressed to the Secretary General of the United Nations to provide his assistance to the Syrian government in order to in investigate the use of chemical materials in the location of Khan al-Asal in Aleppo on the 19th of March. Forty days have elapsed since the Syrian government submitted its official request to the Secretary General. Forty days the Syrian government has been cooperating intensively with the SG as well as with his senior officials and we are still waiting for reaching to any swift and happy conclusion. Yet, you may have heard many trumped up charges and fraudulent accusations orchestrated by here and there against the Syrian government. And I'm here today to to brief you, then to answer your questions appropriately so that you will be all aware of where we are right now with this regard. In, in literature, as you know, you could tell a story by epiphany. In politics, you don't. In politics, we cannot tell a story by epiphany, especially when the issue is so prominent, so delicate, so dangerous, such as the use of chemical weapons somewhere in this world. The issue of chemical weapons in Syria has been part, as you know, of the media, political and diplomatic campaign of incitement on the government of the Syrian Arab Republic aiming at increasing pressure on the government, increasing the political pressure on the Syrian government. This hostile campaign is led by some parties that have made no secret of their hostility and feuds towards Syria since the beginning of the current crisis. The Syrian government has always emphasized in Damascus, the capital, as well as in here, that it will not use, if it possesses, any chemical weapons against its own people. And I stress this point, which has been highly controversial and manipulated by the enemies of Syria to serve their hidden agendas. The government of Syria initiated the request to the United Nations Secretary General for a speedy investigation 
to expose the perpetrators of the heinous crime in the area of Khan al Asal that occurred on March 19, 2013. The important part of the story, ladies and gentlemen, is that a few hours after, a few hours only separated the occurrence of this crime in Khan al Asal and the submitting of the Syrian official request to the Secretary General. More or less precisely 18 hours had elapsed between the moment the rocket landed in Khan al-Asal and the Syrian official move requesting the SG to assist in investigating, in investigating uh, uh, this attack. That was from the beginning a serious and a credible sign of the Syrian government's commitment towards investigating what happened and identifying who did it. During those few hours, all charges for this crime were directed at the Syrian government. Charges that were swiftly promoted by many political and media in the Arab regional and international circles without any corroborated facts. Serious experts and serious diplomats do not judge serious accusations through intelligence assessment, but rather through corroborated facts. and no need to draw your kind attention to the very ugly manipulation of the file of the so-called Iraqi weapons of mass destruction, a file that was, that was open for 18 years through UNSCOM and UNMOVIC investigation, an investigation that cost the Iraqi people billion of dollars, monopolized the expertise of dignitaries in the UN as well as outside of the UN, and after 18 years of so-called investigation, these two commissions of investigations headed by a former IAEA inspector, director general, concluded that they didn't find anything in Iraq. But they were not even given the opportunity to underscore this dramatic conclusion in the archives of the Security Council. And you all know the rest of the story. When the archives of the so-called investigation mission of the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction were put in special cages, sealed, and not allowed to be reopened before six years. So none of us here present will know, officially speaking, the contents of these documents and archives. But we all know for sure that the final conclusion that was that they didn't find anything in Iraq. The initiative of the Syrian government requesting investigation in Khan al-Asal 
deflated this campaign I am referring to, which led the French and the British delegations to try to incite this campaign again and undermine the Syrian initiative by asking for an investigation into the alleged use of chemical weapons in other parts of Syria. Despite our observations on the request submitted by France and Britain and the subsequent serious request submitted by Qatar to the Secretary General claiming the use of chemical weapons in other parts of Syria without even mentioning the date of the incident or the designated area where it took place. And in spite of the fact that these requests come from countries who declared hostility to Syria publicly since the beginning of the crisis. Despite of all this and that, the Syrian government is still waiting to receive information on these allegations. Those mentioned countries are required to provide credible information about the alleged incidents to be evaluated and assessed. There cannot be at any time a mission of investigation of a limited number of people moving freely on the Syrian territory just on the basis of letters containing unfounded allegations and have clear instigating goals. We expect from the Secretariat not to be part of this campaign against Syria because what happened in Iraq, as I said, is still alive in our minds till this very moment. Our region, ladies and gentlemen, is still living the consequences of such false allegations. The Syrian government cooperation with the Secretariat has always been honest and clear, and we requested for an investigation in the incident of Khan al-Asal, as I said, hours after the incident took place. The Syrian government is still willing to receive the investigation team in even less than 24 hours based on the agreement that has been reached with Mrs. Kane on April 4th, 2013. The Syrian government did not close the doors of the United Nations and the investigation mission to look into any other allegations. But the principles of respecting international law and the Charter of the United Nations require a strict respect of the sovereignty of states, member states, and accordingly the details of any incident that foreign countries claimed they occurred on the territory of the Syrian Arab Republic should be shared with the Syrian government as it is the main concerned party. It's very interesting, ladies and gentlemen, to know that these information re related or relevant to the French, British and Qatari allegations have not been shared yet with any of the members of the Security Council. None of the members of the Security Council is aware of the content of these allegations. So people who are basically responsible for maintaining peace and security in the world are not aware of any details related to these allegations. And the funny part of the story is that members of the Security Council have been waiting for 40 days to be briefed by somebody, the Secretary General himself, if, if he knows, if he knows, if he is aware, or Mrs. Kane, 
or anybody else. So these loopholes are very indicative of the fact that the whole story about the other allegations is rather <coughs> uh, uh, irrelevant to the main issue, which is what happened in Khan al-Assad. Regrettably, we have not received until today, in spite of our repeated requests, any information on those allegations. But the Secretariat, as you know, has been diligent, diligently releasing statements that might give the impression that the Syrian government is not cooperating with the UN in conducting this investigation. One day we hear the spokesperson calling on the Syrian government to cooperate. The other day we hear somebody else in The Hague or somewhere else that uh, the UN is still waiting for the Syrian government to allow the team to deploy in Syria. Uh, then we hear uh, on another occasion uh, another statement, alarming statement, saying that uh, somebody, without naming him, is taking seriously uh, the allegations uh, provided uh, to him by one member state. And all these uh, alarming statements are not shared with the Syrian government neither with the members of the Security Council. So we are moving in a vacuum, seemingly, on a very crucial issue. I see today myself obli obliged to read what I stated, what is stated in a letter by Mrs. Angela Kane, sent on April the 3rd, 2013, which confirmed that, and let me read out the content of her letter. We have it. I quote, I wish to confirm that the investigation mission will look at the specific incident brought to his attention, to the Secretary General's attention, by your government and investigate the facts related to the reported incident on 19th March 2013 at Khan al-Asal in Aleppo Governorate. The mission will gather relevant data and undertake the necessary analysis for this purpose. Then, the secret in this connection, the Secretary General continues to assess the reports submitted by the governments of France and the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, pursuant to their joint request of 21st March 2013, to which the Secretary General had referred in his above-mentioned letter. The Secretary General continues to assess, but he is committing himself in the first paragraph, to investigate into the specific incident that took place in Khan al-Assad. The letter is dated April 3rd. I would like also to read to you what is stated in our letter, dated April 4th, meaning one day after Mrs. Kane sent her letter on behalf of the SG to myself. In response to Mrs. Kane's letter mentioned above, in which we emphasized our agreement to what was stated in Mrs. Kane's letter, we confirmed in a written form in our letter one day after that we agree to what she mentioned in her letter and our willingness to discuss and our willingness to discuss the remaining logistical details logistical details concerning the work of the mission in Syria indeed a short discussion 
session was held to look into those technical details, logistical details. On, in the afternoon of April 4th, however, after the beginning of this session between my delegation and Mrs. Kane's delegation, Mrs. Kane and her team suggested that the discussions be postponed to the next morning in order to hold a long morning session to complete all the terms of the modalities, thus allowing for investigation mission to go to Syria as soon as possible. We were surprised the next day by the request of Mrs. Kane to meet with us without mentioning the question of convening a discussion session on the remaining logistical details as agreed upon. Mrs. Kane handed us a letter dated April 4th, 5th, which contains details that contradict with all what is stated in her previous letter of April 3rd and to all what we had discussed the afternoon of April 4th. When we asked her about the reason for this discrepancy, she told us that the Secretary General has been notified of new information about the French and British allegations, although he was then in The Hague. <coughs> it is surprising that the Secretary General had new information available to him in less than 24 hours on an incident allegedly occurred on December 23, 2012. December 23, 2012, meaning an incident allegedly occurred four months before the Syrian government submitted its request to investigate the incident that occurred in Khan al-Asar. They waited four months the French and British governments waited four months before sharing with the SG while he was in The Hague and hours after we made a deal with Mrs. Kane, other allegations related to other uh, claims. The Syrian government and the Secretariat has exchanged many letters and my government has sent so far nine letters, nine official letters signed by either the Minister for Foreign Affairs or myself upon instructions from my government. These nine letters were in response to the to eight letters that originated from the Secretariat. This exchange of letters is an evidence of the willingness and cooperation of the Syrian government towards the United Nations in order to stand on the truth behind the crime perpetrated in Khan al Asr. The Syrian government insists that it is still awaiting the arrival of a team of experts to the site of Khan al Asr to determine the accuracy of the information sent by the Syrian government to the Secretariat. And we are still awaiting the receipt of any other credible information about the other allegations. The Syrian government believes that the only way for the investigation mission to check the truth of what happened is through going to Syria and conducting investigations on the ground at the site of Khan al-Asal and not towering capitals here and there. We are here to request once again the Secretary General to cooperate with us swiftly in order to fulfill our previous request to initiate an independent, genuine, technical, investigation in Khan al-Asal. And we believe that the best way to reach a credible outcome through this mission can only be achieved through deploying without any delay 
the mission and the reported incident in Khan al Asal. Before I conclude, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to share with you another alarming news coming from the city of Saraqib in Idlib in the northern western part of Syria next to the Turkish border. Yesterday, the armed terrorist groups in Saraqib, realizing the very serious breakthrough achieved by the Syrian army in that area, spread seemingly the contents of plastic bags containing most probably a kind of powder which is which might be most probably a kind of chemical materials spread these chemical materials amongst the crowds in Saraqib many people were affected by this heinous, irresponsible act and the wounded as well as the victims had manifested signs similar to those during the use of chemical weapons. And as part of the uh, prepared, pre-arranged arrangements, pre-arranged scenario, the victims were transported into Turkey to be treated in Turkish hospitals and then of course I am quite sure that today or tomorrow you will hear again that the Turkish government has new tools indicating that the Syrian government used chemical weapons against its own people as we say in Saraqib. The point is that after failing in presenting any corroborated facts with regard all the other allegations, it seems now that some intelligence here and there among the capitals that are directly involved in the bloodshed of the Syrian people are looking to a new strategy which is to set up any kind of tools or proofs that would implicate or involve the Syrian government on false basis with regard to the use of chemical weapons. So rather than answering swiftly the Syrian official request to investigate the use of chemical weapons in Khan al Asal, we have been waiting for 40 days, giving enough time to all those who are trying to manipulate the scene so that they would find out another deviation from the initial path, which is Khan al-Asal, to focus on something else, somewhere else, A, to undermine any chances of success of the Syrian request to investigate, B, to deviate the attention from the serious crime perpetrated in Khan al-Asal, and to shift the attention of the public opinion 
towards invisible areas arranged, created by some intelligence services. I'm in your hands. It's not working? Okay. My name is Talal Hajj from Al Arabian News Channel, and on behalf of uh, the Executive Committee of United Nations Correspondent Association, we thank you for this briefing at this very important juncture. Uh, I have two, two questions. One in details the letter of Angela Kane on the 3rd of April. Did it mention that the United Nations Secretary General was assessing, continuing to assess, the the two requests of the British and the French while agreeing to your rec government request and uh, could you make that letter available to the press for us, uh, copies of that letter, if it's possible? To, to correspondents of the United Nations? We um, don't have anything to hide. Uh, fine, the thank you. Thank no, you. No, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. We are diplomats and we are still negotiating with the Secretariat the uh, final formalities for achieving and fulfilling this mission of investigation. So you may understand that being diplomat requires to be uh, more cautious than, than somebody else. But however, you all have cameras and I will show you again the letter. My <laughs> this way. My, yeah. my question, sir. Don't you have cameras here this way? We do, we do. Yeah. My, my question, sir, does it's, she say in the letter... It's two pages. <laughs> my question, sir, does the... Uh, Ms. Angela Kane, does she state that the Secretary General is continuing to assess the, uh, the two requests from the British and the French government and awaiting their, their details? Because he asked them for more, for more details. Uh, before he accept their request to investigate another two positions or two places in Syria. And, and, more, and a more uh, wider question is, uh, you know and we all know that the Secretary General cannot ignore a request from the British and the government or any government to investigate uh, an incident that threatened peace and security. Now, he asked for more details and he got more details and in his judgment, he found that these details warrant an investigation. The question is, which many people ask and argue is, why doesn't Syria accept, especially that they dropped al uh request to investigate, they are just insisting on Hans and Khan al-Assal. Why doesn't the Syrian government, what people argue, if has nothing to hide, accept that they, they investigate these two places and put the matter to rest? If the Syrian government has nothing to hide, why doesn't it accept the entry of the inspectors, and for all to see, the whole world to see, and put the matter to rest. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do not interfere in the competences of the Secretary General. Our point of view is that from the beginning, it wasn't us who asked for the investigation. It wasn't France, it wasn't Britain, it wasn't Qatar. It was the Syrian government responsible for the safety and well-being of its own people that requested the investigation. We were asked by the Secretary General to provide answers to 18 technical questions later on. Later on to which we answered, the government answered 18 technical questions related to technicalities, not logisticals, to technicalities related, relevant to the incident. Important scientific questions related to what happened in Khan al-Assad. My government answered these 18 questions in a matter of 24 hours. And then we reply to, this, to the SG with the, with the answers. <clears throat> Among these questions were one question uh, asking whether the Syrian government uh, has 
samples, uh, blood samples, uh, footages of the incident, testimonies by the wounded, uh, suffocated people, etc., etc. Reports, medical reports of the doctors who treated the, uh, the, the wounded and the victims in the hospitals, etc., etc., etc. So all these questions were answered swiftly and promptly by the Syrian competent authorities. If you compare this Syrian government's uh, way of acting and reacting, I mean interacting with, this, with the Secretariat, if you compare this way, very transparent, very swift, very prompt, with the non-engagement and non-sharing of information by the other parties who, who, who are accusing the Syrian government of using the chemical weapons, then you would jump easily to the conclusion that they are not serious. If they had any proof, any evidence, any tools, credible, they should share it with the Secretary General. They should share it with us. They should share it with the remaining, the other members of the Security Council. But this didn't happen. Why? The reason, uh, the answer, I leave it up to your wisdom. Question, sir. Does All the, that I didn't answer. My, no, no, no. Uh, the details in the letter, does it say that the Secretary General continues to assess in the first letter of the third I, of I told you at the beginning, I do not interfere in the competence of the Secretary General. In this letter, what is important for my government is that we have a clear-cut crystal commitment. Yes. Crystal-cut commitment. But there is a caveat. Hold on from the Secretary General that the investigation will be focused specifically on the incident that took place in Khan al-Assad. Now, the Secretary General can continue assessing. This is his full competence. We do not interfere in that. Let him continue assessing whatever he wants. But as long as these allegations are related to Syria, my country, he should share this information, if he has any, if he has any, he should share this information with the Syrian government as well as with the other members of the Security Council. Otherwise, as I said at the beginning, this very important and crucial matter cannot be dealt by epiphany. Direct speech is the uh, only suitable way of discussing this matter among member states. But you have nothing to hide. Hide what? A anything to hide. I mean, you didn't answer the, the criticism. Ambassador, yes. James Bays from Al Jazeera. Can you just make this clear? If the British and the French provide all their evidence to you and they say they have some evidence, will you then consider letting the inspectors investigate those incidents? We said that in one of our letters, actually, to the Secretary General. I don't remember which one, uh, but we said that let us now fulfill, achieve in a credible manner, impartial, independent manner, the investigation in Khan al-Assad. Then, if the Syrian government and the Secretary General and the Security Council members feel that these allegations are also credible, the Syrian government might might examine the possibility of asking for further investigation. So you are determining the scope of any investigation? We are determined to finalize first Khan al-Assal incident. This, is, this, yes, we are determined. As a non-signatory... Uh, sorry, uh, so I, will I will give you the floor. But I, I, I need to continue a little bit uh, answering the, the previous question. Uh, we, we have also uh, a problem of trust with the Syrian government. We have a problem of trust with those who are providing these so-called allegations. Number one, because they are involved in supporting the uh, terrorist groups and the armed groups in Syria. They are involved in sponsoring terrorism in Syria. 
They are involved in supplying weapons to the armed groups. They are involved in uh, uh, aiming at destabilizing the country and supporting and protecting the, uh, uh, the terrorist groups who, who are uh, responsible for many suicide bombings in Syria, as well as many uh, booby cars uh, attacks uh, in Syria too. This is number one. Number two, it's, uh, it's, it's very uh, indicative and informative to know that, and here I am just trying to refresh your memory, that uh, France and Britain, basically speaking, but not exclusively, unfortunately, uh, were the first uh, countries in the world with Germany who used weapons of mass destruction. So, you know, in, uh, in, uh, in tribunal, in courts, uh, anybody who has an, an, an antecedent cannot be part of the jury. The judge will ask him to leave, to desist from representing the public opinion in any jury if, if he or she has an antecedent. Let me read out for you what the Churchill said. Churchill said, of course, uh, Britain was the first to introduce the chemical warfare uh, to the Middle East. To the Middle East. I'm not talking about the First World War. We all know what happened there. To the Middle East. After the British Army dropped mustard gas bombs on Iraq tribes that resisted the British colonial rule. Winston Churchill, then Secretary of State for War and Air, declared at the time, and I read, and I quote, I'm strongly in favor of using poisoned gas against uncivilized tribes to spread a lively terror, unquote. But also, sir, if you look at history, you see that Britain and France have signed up for the Convention against Chemical Weapons, and your government I'm not, I'm not denying that, but I said when he or she has an antecedent, criminal, past, he or she cannot be part of the jury. This is the point. But France uh, tested its first nuclear bomb in the Algerian desert on a human being alive. This is another scandal. I don't want to go into details. It's a big headache for them, and I have a lot of information to share with you. You know that. And what? And what? You are in a hurry, I could stop. If you are in a hurry, I could stop. What I am saying is that uh, when you have such bloody experiences perpetrated by the hands of the same countries, besides, we all need not to forget what they did in Iraq. We all need not to forget that the liberation of Libya spread terror all over the world, jihadists all over the world, and the Libyan weaponry is now found everywhere, including in Sinai in Egypt, including in Lebanon and Syria, including in Mali, Niger. These are corroborated, corroborated facts. We cannot ignore. So anybody could have the right to to share with the international community any information. We are not against, but we need this information to come from impartial side, from genuine parties, not from ca countries h highly involved in the Syrian bloodshed. Uh, as an non-signatory to the uh, convention, uh, is it your position that Syria has or does not have chemical weapons? And also, does it control it? And if not, how did the rebels, uh, or, or if so, how did the rebels get, uh, get hold of them? Where is this letter uh, we sent to the security council? On December the 8th, I sent an official 
identical letters, we, we call it, two identical letters to both the Secretary General as well as to the uh, members of the Security Council. In these two identical letters, we made reference to what the Turkish newspapers, Yurt, Y-U-R-T, has reported about Al-Qaeda members being producing chemical weapons in a laboratory near the Turkish city of Ghazi Intab that they are threatening to use against Syrian civilians. That was December the 8th. I said no, December, yes. Yurt, the Turkish newspaper, has drawn attention to videos posted on the internet demonstrating how to make poison gas from such chemicals as Al-Qaeda has obtained from Turkish companies and tested on living creatures. I wonder whether you are aware of this horrible, appalling test by Al-Qaeda members in this laboratory within the Turkish territory on the rabbits. I don't know whether you are aware of that or not. It's on the YouTube. It's on the YouTube. In this uh, test of chemical materials, materials on rabbits, the terrorist scientists who are uh, in this footage threaten that this is a first test and then the real use of these chemical weapons would be implemented later on against the Syrian regime. They said it on December the 8th on a YouTube you can have access to it. If you don't, I will give you a copy of my letter addressed to the Security Council. This I can give it to you. December the 8th. Of course, uh, the freedom of speech everywhere in the world would prevent you from, getting, from having access to this letter, this kind of letters, as long as it contains uh, important information. For those... For for those who are interested, I can provide you with a copy of this letter. The, the important part of the story is that we didn't get any reaction from the Council. We didn't get any, any reaction from the Council. I know this is your, your, your wholeheartedly uh, uh, important question for you. Hold on, hold on, please. He would think that I am escaping his question. And then he might think that he has a scoop to make. <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> During the last uh, year or so, as I said at the beginning, you may have heard many uh, fraudulent uh, accusations uh, about the uh, so-called uh, chemical weapons in Syria. And, of course, uh, a, an orchestrated campaign was uh, broadcasted, uh, trumped up charges uh, against the Syrian uh, uh, government. But you know what? We have been repeatedly endorsing as uh, what we call international community in this international organization called the United Nations. We have been endorsing repeatedly for decades if I'm not mistaken, maybe 30, 35 years or 40 years so far, many resolutions on the establishment in the Middle East of a zone free from all weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, biological, and, and chemicals, as well as hundreds of resolutions calling for the dismantlement of the Israeli nuclear arsenal. Western reports, Western uh, think tanks, uh, Israeli think tanks, have all disclosed to the so-called public opinion that 
the Israeli nuclear arsenal has become a threat to peace and security of everybody, not only in the Middle East, but all over the world. We haven't heard you, sir, asking any question with regard to Israeli, uh, how to dismantle the Israeli nuclear arsenal. Although Israeli scientists have raised uh, a high degree, high level awareness of the seriousness of threats of the Israeli nuclear site in Naqab, Negev, because you know this plant is 40, 50 years old. It's a secret uh, location to the Israelis, uh, to, to the Israeli government only, but not to the uh, public opinion. So the main threat in the area is the Israeli nuclear arsenal, but Syria and all the other countries in the region have shown their willingness and their commitment to join the establishment in the Middle East of a zone free from all weapons of mass destruction, chemicals, biological, and nuclear. The only side or party that has not yet expressed its willingness to join is Israel. And we all know that an international conference was planned to be held in 2012 for the sake of achieving this very noble and lofty goal which is the establishment of a zone free from all weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. Israel did not accept to attend. Although this conference, as you know, was an integral part of the final document of the review conference of the NPT, which was held in New York in 2010. So this is the main issue. This is the main issue. If, if you understand about Israel, you would have raised your concern with the Israeli towards the Israeli nuclear arsenal long time ago. Long time ago. You had indicated in your exchange of letters with the Secretariat that they had requested blood samples, footage, medical reports, testimonies of people who were suffocated. Number one, uh, did you respond, did the Syrian government respond with detailed information on each of those yes. items? Yes, yes. And secondly, if the um, other alleged incidents, or those who are making the allegations about the other alleged incidents, were to provide to the Secretariat, and to a Security Council comparable detailed information, uh, at least underlie their allegations, and the Secretary deems that to be equivalent to what you provided, we would you accept that? We we are are they didn't share with us. But if they did, would you, uh, would the Syrian government at least accept that, uh, that as a basis for allowing an expanded investigation? In other words, a certification that information as detailed as yours would, would provide by the other uh, nations making this Your question is a hypothetical one. I, I don't comment on hypotheses. Uh, we, need, we need everybody who, have, who has information or have information to share it with us. Then it will be up to us, scientifically speaking, politically speaking, technically speaking, to analyze, to assess, and then to judge, after all, whether it is worth it uh, asking again for investigation or not. But, you know, if if some people are still reluctant and hesitant towards investigating something that happened really in Khan al-Asal, how could you move to another file while the main file has not been addressed yet? We have a file. We have victims. We have bodies. We have wounded. We have footage. We have blood samples. We have, uh, we have all the tools necessary to prove that chemical weapons were used in Khan al-Asal. And some people are still turning around, looking for some... Uh, artificial fronts to investigate something else. Let us focus on what we have as facts. Thank you. Um, so to just clarify then, you're saying that it's the fault of the United Nations that they haven't gone to Khan Asal yet because they won't 
comply with your your it, territorial it's sovereignty not, It's not the fault of the United Nations. It's the fault of those countries, influential, who are exerting political pressure on the SG in order not to let him go ahead with the investigation on Khan al-Assad incident. But why not let that part go ahead to prove your good faith and so that the evidence that you have doesn't deteriorate or degrade in, in the interim? It's already been 40 days, as you said. Everybody should have good faith, not only the Syrian side. I wanted to, uh, you know, thanks for taking these questions on behalf of the UN Coalition for Access. Uh, yesterday there was the presentation by the Secretary General and we didn't get any Q&A. So I wanted to actually ask you first what you thought of what the Secretary General said yesterday in the lobby. And also what, I've looked it up, it, it, it seems like on April 4th and 5th he was in Madrid and not in The Hague. He was meeting with his Chief Executive's Board. Do you have any insight into what happened between, you, you, know, you, you put forward the time schedule pretty clear, clearly between this April 4th meeting with Angela Cain and uh, the about face on the 5th. Do you have any idea who we spoke with, what took place? And also, just finally, what do you think of the, the fourth draft of the GA resolution? You, kept, you said it's UK, France, and Qatar, and there's obviously this pending proposed uh, draft. Do you, do you think it's any closer? Do you still think that it's a declaration of war? What do you think of the draft GA resolution? Thank you. Uh, number one, uh, as I have elaborated uh, in my initial briefing, we all know what uh, took place in the discussions between me and Mrs. Angela Cain. This I know for sure. But besides that, what happened in The Hague, what happened between the 4th and the 5th, I'm not aware. But I could easily uh, conclude that while the SG was in The Hague and uh, after he knew about the agreement between me and Mrs. Kane, he got some calls from somewhere, or he did some calls to somebody, and he got a counter, uh, uh, a counter move, asking him to to go back on his initial uh, commitment. This is why I said in my previous, uh, in ans answering the previous question, that uh, I think that it is not the, the SG's responsi resp responsibility, uh, mainly speaking, directly speaking. I think that he, he has been under tremendous, uh, enormous uh, political pressure from some permanent members in the Council who asked him to shift from his initial uh, uh, standpoint. Now, with regard to the, uh, the draft resolution elaborated by uh, uh, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, France, Egypt, France uh, England, and USA in the General Assembly, you are right when you said that uh, they moved so far to version 4. My own feeling is that they will reach version 10. because they know for sure that the language they are using uh, in the draft is a declaration of war against the sovereignty of a member state. And many member states in this uh, August international organization have serious concerns with regard to this machination by these countries aiming at, the, at misusing the mechanisms of the United Nations for harming the interest of a member state sovereign, equally sovereign to any other member states. The Qatari draft resolution is uh, mainly speaking, actually uh, I wouldn't call it Qatari draft resolution. They are using Qatar as a puppet show, but it's not Qatar. This draft resolution uh, has only one goal, changing the game, game change, and regime change, preparing the ground for a further draft resolution that might emerge soon, this is what they think, soon after the adoption of this draft resolution, uh, they might go ahead with submitting another draft resolution aiming at uh, uh, calling 
the General Assembly plenary uh, to delegitimize the Syrian representation at the United Nations and then subsequently to give the seat to the extremist wing of the external oppo uh, opposition outside of Syria. This is the strategy of the drafters. It's not about uh, the protection of human rights. It's not about the protection of uh, human lives. Uh, it's not about uh, helping the Syrian people and the Syrian government uh, uh, in to stop the bloodshed. Uh, these people are Machiavellic. They have no shame whatsoever in dealing with the suffering of the Syrian people uh, through uh, uh, diabolic uh, mechanisms based on misusing the United Nations Forum, highest democratic forum, the General Assembly, in order to tarnish the reputation of the Syrian government and try to topple the legitimate uh, representation of the Syrian government in the United Nations. Ambassador? Our, our colleague asks a fairly straightforward question about chemical weapons existence in Syria and how they're contained. Can you please answer his question? And then I have a, a question as to why you're trying to limit the scope of the UN investigation to this one incident back uh, 40 days ago or a little more than 40 days ago when we're now hearing in the media talk of red lines being crossed. You yourself mentioned an incident yesterday uh, concerning white powder. Why, why keep this limited to the one incident? The use of chemical weapons in Syria and elsewhere in the world is not only a red line. It's a purple line. It's a blood line. And nobody is tolerated or will be tolerated to use such horrific weapon of mass destruction. As I said at the beginning, those who used the chemical weapons in the past were not held responsible. We never held, we never heard about anybody being held responsible for the use of chemical weapons from France, Britain, or USA, or, or any other country. We all know what happened in Fallujah, in Iraq. We all know what happened in Libya during the Italian occupation. They used the gas against the Libyans against Omar al-Mukhtar forces at that time. The British used it during Churchill, again in Iraq. France used its nuclear capabilities, first, its first uh, tested its first nuclear bomb in Algeria uh, on a human alive, on human beings alive. So many scandals happened with regard the use of weapons of mass destruction and we never heard anybody held responsible. If, if, I'm saying, in one case at least, somebody was held responsible, nobody else would have dared using chemical weapons or biological weapons. Like in Vietnam, we all know what, uh, what happened with the orange agent. Uh, nobody would have dared using chemical weapons uh, anywhere in the world. So, uh, we don't need to hear any preachers uh, from anybody with this regard because uh, as far as we are concerned, my government has adhered to the Geneva Protocol of 1925 on the prohibition of the use of chemical uh, weapons and gases. So we are already an integrated part in this international community uh, in all kinds of international conventions regulating this very important uh, uh, matter. Number two, uh, I'm glad that you are trying to be the lawyer of your friend, of your col colleague, uh, in repeating the same question. But I think that I have already answered uh, this question uh, through lengthy, in, in a lengthy matter uh, through my, my briefing. Syria will never be part of any uh, machination uh, or will not fall in any trap with regard to uh, this uh, upholding and horrible uh, uh, matter. 
we won't and we were actually as you remember we were the ones who initiated a draft resolution in the Security Council when we, when we were member in the Council in, two, in, two, in 2003. Uh, we submitted an initiative, draft resolution, which is still in blue, actually, in the drawers of the Council, uh, on the establishment of a zone free from all weapons of mass destruction in the Middle East. Unfortunately, we were objected uh, at that time by an influential permanent member, uh, and the whole process was stopped. Thank you very much.